Good afternoon to everyone who's already joined us. My name is Kim Beer. I'm the Director of Public Policy at the Cresta Rendina Reed Foundation, and we'll get started in just a couple of minutes. Thank you so much. Okay, why don't we go ahead and get started again. My name is Kim Beer. Um, as I mentioned, I'm the Director of Public Policy at the Christopher and Dana Reed Foundation. And my colleagues and I are thrilled to welcome you back for the part three of a three-part webinar series addressing accessible health care for persons with paralysis and mobility disabilities. But this is an issue that we know is extremely important, not only for many disability organizations, for the Reed Foundation, and for many of you who are learning uh, more about self-advocacy and ways you can get involved with the foundation to help us improve this, it, this issue and to work on it together. So before we get started, I just want to let everyone know who will be on the panel today. Uh, I will lead off our, our panel today and our webinar, and then we are so thrilled to welcome back Andres Gallegos, who has been um, such an exceptional and helpful support and, and so much expertise and help, and he, and he presented our first two webinars in, during the summer, and I'm so grateful and thankful for all of his expertise and advice and recommendations and suggestions. And I really look forward to continuing, uh, the Reed Foundation to continuing to work with him on this issue. And of course, my colleague, Chris Carson, who's recently joined us, he's the policy and advocacy coordinator at the foundation. And you'll hear a little bit later on uh, ways, in you, uh, ways in which you may be interested in getting involved in our advocacy efforts. So let's get started. So this webinar is really going to be focusing on a little bit of a, of a review of what we talked about during the summer. Um, just as a reminder, our webinars are posted on our Reeve YouTube channel. And we held our part one uh, series and part two back in July and uh, August. We're going to have Andreas briefly go over some of the key points in both of those webinars before we get to some of the ways that the Reeve Foundation is working on improving this issue as well as ways you can get involved. I'll also address some things that may be obvious to you, but um, again, how, especially in this time where we feel a little disconnected and perhaps spending a little too much time on, on our computers, there's ways that we can really stay engaged and create momentum around certain, certain issues to, to really make change, even though it may feel like um, it's not possible. It's definitely possible during this time. So we'll talk a little bit about that. I will address a little bit of our of founda the foundation's public policy priorities and how we have decided to take on accessible health care, not only throughout the rest of this year, but of course working with a, a new Congress and possibly a new administration in 2021. And then finally, as I mentioned, my colleague Chris will talk about how you hopefully would like to be part of our efforts and ways that you can get involved and also connect with other individuals around the country who are, have the same advocacy passions you might have. So Andres, I'm going to turn it over to you and I'll, I'll move it over to this first slide and we welcome you to, to kind of give us a review of our last two webinars. Kim, Kim thank you. It's a pleasure to be back and 
uh, to be presenting here with you and, and with Chris and, and welcome to everybody who's attending and participating uh, in this afternoon's webinar. If you were with us um, back in July and August, uh, we started focusing on accessible healthcare for persons with paralysis and mobility disabilities, first by looking at um, barriers that affect persons with paralysis mobility disabilities, barriers that affect them uh, from accessing accessible healthcare services, uh, dental care services, mental health services, uh, and other uh, healthcare related services. We looked at these five categories, broad categories of barriers, really focusing on the last three being the attitudinal barriers, policy barriers, and physical barriers. It, what concerns me most out of all of these really is the attitudinal barriers as those are invisible. Uh, the physical barriers we see, policy barriers we know of, um, but these attitudinal barriers, we don't know that they exist until they manifest themselves, either uh, in a discriminatory rationing policy, in a denial of a care decision, or a healthcare provider's assessment of our quality of life from which then they base the decision to provide or withhold life-sustaining treatment, as was the case recently that we talked about briefly uh, in Austin, Texas, uh, in the case of Mr. Michael Hickson. So next slide. The physical barriers, it's, it's what you see here, right? It's the examination table that's not uh, height adjustable. It's the weight scale that is traditional scale, but not one that is wheelchair accessible. It's the treatment chair that doesn't, uh, is not height adjustable or doesn't tilt and recline. It's a changing room that's not accessible for people who use mobility devices. Obviously stairs instead of ramps and examination rooms that are too small. All of these physical barriers preclude us from getting the equal breadth of examinations that persons who are not disabled uh, may be able to receive. It precludes us from being weighed when it's clinically appropriate that we know what our weight is. It's our inability to be transferred from our mobility device onto an examination chair or examination table to receive a thorough examination when it's clinically appropriate to do so. These barriers exist, these physical barriers exist, notwithstanding the fact that it's been 30 years since the passage of the ADA and nearly 50 years since the passage of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973. Laws that give us our rights and laws that give impose obligations upon healthcare providers to provide us with accessible care. But as we know, day in and day out, our lived experiences and that of our friends and loved ones is, that's not taking place. Next slide. Examples of policy barriers. Uh, as we discussed in the webinar very thoroughly, uh, it's not being scheduled enough time for our appointments. We're often rushed, and depending on what clinic that you go to, uh, medical providers may be on a very tight schedule uh, where they're just seeing volumes of patients day in and day out, and they don't have much time to spend with an individual patient. We know that we need extra time if we need assistance transferring out of our uh, mobility devices or we need assistance filling out paperwork uh, or getting dressed and undressed. And so scheduling, not scheduling enough time for appointments is an example of a policy barrier. Scheduling appointments in accessible facilities or examination rooms. To the extent that a clinic does have an accessible examination table, we need to make sure that we get our, our scene in those rooms so that we have enough room to safely maneuver and transfer when needed. Uh, the purchasing of accessible equipment and furniture it's a policy decision. Uh, accessible diagnostic equipment and furniture exist. They're being manufactured. The price differential is not significantly different from those of traditional equipment. And making a conscious decision to buy those is a matter of policy. Uh, adopting accessible policies and procedures, again, for a hospital or medical practice, it's a conscious decision, a deliberate decision to say that I'm going to make sure that all of our services, all of the policies and procedures that implement our services 
are in fact designed and implemented in a way that accounts for the needs of people with paralysis and mobility disabilities. Training on non-discrimination mandates, you know, again, the obligation to legal providers to provide healthcare in a non-discriminatory manner has been around for 50 years under the Rehabilitation Act and 30 years under the ADA. But what I find daily is that healthcare providers don't know what their obligations are. And to the extent that they do provide accessible equipment, uh, they seldom know how to use it or where to locate lift equipment or where a wheelchair accessible weight scale may be within the hospital. So training is vitally important. And, and part and parcel of that training is to know how to deal and interact with people with disabilities of all categories of disabilities. And that's found in culturally competent uh, competency training for healthcare providers. Next slide. We talk about acting bad. Uh, an individual patient advocacy strategy that approaches advocacy, patient advocacy in three stages. Uh, things that a person must do before the appointment, during the appointment, and then after the appointment, acting bad. Before the appointment is the homework stage. It's researching the facility, researching the physician, researching your condition so you can be an informed patient. During the appointment, giving feedback to a provider, to a clinic on their accessibility and how they're interacting with you, whether or not they, they fulfilled your accommodation request that you made before the appointment. And just give them that positive or negative feedback uh, during the appointment. And then after the appointment, which is the homework phase, and that's where you problem solve as opposed to just treating this issue as a complaint. We talked about the difference between a problem and a complaint. Problems beg to be solved, complaints beg to be heard. Uh, you have to look at patient advocacy as an organized three-phase approach where after the appointment, you take action. Action by either filing a formal complaint to try to get uh, issues addressed with the healthcare provider. If that doesn't work, if you're part of a managed care organization, you address the issue with the managed care organization. And if that doesn't work, then you look uh, to your support in your community, the support being either a center for independent living to help you advocate for change or a protection and advocacy organization, which is a legal organization within your state that's designated by the governor as being the agency responsible for the protection and advocacy of persons with disabilities. And if they can't assist, then locate a disability rights attorney, file a complaint with the Department of Justice, with the Office of Civil Rights for Health and Human Services, or with your state's attorney general's office. Again, it's problem solving that third stage of acting bad that differentiates uh, treating these accessible healthcare problems as problems and simply not complaints. Next one. And then finally, we looked at patient rights, some examples. Again, you have, an, you have a right uh, under the ADA and under the Rehabilitation Act uh, to these things that you see here. Now, these aren't specifically articulated uh, within the ADA or the Rehabilitation Act of 1973 or the regulations. But when they talk about that we have an equal opportunity to benefit from a provider's goods and services, what it means is that we have the right to attend by ourselves and to receive the assistance that we may require uh, from a healthcare provider. We have a right to bring someone with us as well to assist us if we need them to assist us. But as I cautioned, if you bring someone with you, avoid the temptation to enable the provider, enable them to not fulfill their legal requirements by having your assistant do everything that they, the medical provider, is required to do. We have a system, we have a right to receive assistance when we check in to completing forms, to getting dressed, to get undressed, uh, to have questions answered, to provide all of our protected health information if we're not able to complete the forms 
on our own. And we have a right to request for additional time for examinations and treatments if we need assistance transferring, or we certainly need more time with our provider to ask questions and uh, understand truly what's taking place for that particular procedure or treatment. And we have a right to utilize an examination room that's accessible, one where we can maneuver without injuring ourselves or damaging our mobility equipment. Next slide. More examples of our rights. Again, the rights to be uh, have assistance with dressing and undressing, changing in the gowns, <clears throat> getting our coats on or off, having our weight taken by an accessible weight scale. Because in the absence of a, a wheelchair weight scale, <clears throat> they simply ask us for our weight, they guess our weight, or they use a previously recorded weight, and who knows where that weight was taken and whether or not that was accurate. And again, was clinically appropriate to be transferred onto the examination table, onto the examination chair, and be safely lifted if we deem that lifting is proper for us, or to insist that they use lift equipment or transfer equipment that in some states, only 11 states, they're required to have by legislation and regulation. Um, and we talked about our right to refuse any and all assistance, even though we may fight to have that assistance available, you still, every time you have an appointment, have the right to accept that assistance or reject that assistance um, altogether. Next slide. In our second webinar, we talked about uh, COVID and its impact upon persons with paralysis and mobility uh, disabilities. And we looked at the discriminatory crisis standards of care. Uh, crisis standards of care are policies that either states, healthcare systems, counties, or hospitals implement when there is a crisis, a medical crisis, that requires healthcare providers to determine whether or not medical care, medical, medical equipment, or medical supplies are going to be rationed. Um, when the COVID pandemic broke, what we saw is that many states, because they were limited in supplies and overwhelmed with the number of patients affected uh, with COVID-19, that they began rationing care. And what was alarming to the disability community is that many of these crisis standards of care that were being implemented facially were discriminatory because they determined that if a person needed assistance with one or more activities of daily living, that they could be justifiably denied care. That if we showed up with our own ventilators, that a medical provider had the right to take that ventilator away from us and to give it to somebody else who they deemed had a better chance of recovering from the infection, the virus, than what we did. Uh, disability itself is not an indication of how poorly we may react to COVID or to COVID interventions. Disability is not synonymous with being unhealthy. However, if you are disabled and you have a disability and you have some of the underlying conditions that can lead to complications, well, then that's of great concern. And those complications are if we have diabetes, if we have any kind of respiratory uh, conditions, uh, if we're obese, um, if we are older of age, um, because what we know is that the older that you are, uh, the most uh, negative impact that the COVID uh, infection uh, has. Um, so if you have these other conditions, coupled with a disability, then it may lead to poor outcomes and treatment, but it doesn't mean that a healthcare provider can simply um, discriminate against us and determine simply based on our disability that we are not worthy of receiving treatment or we're not worthy of receiving uh, particular care. And we talked about how to fight back 
and to make sure that we're not discriminated against when healthcare rationing decisions need to be made. More examples of discriminatory uh, crisis standards of care. Next slide. Again, categorical exclusions that we just talked about. In response to this, the Department of Health and Human Services, Office of Civil Rights, along with the Department of Justice, uh, they issued bulletins to all healthcare providers, reminding them that the federal non-discrimination mandates found in the Rehabilitation Act, in the ADA, and then in Section 1557 of the Affordable Care Act still applied during pandemics, that they couldn't discriminate against us simply because of our disability. And what we saw are many of the things that you see here, the deprioritization of us due to our disability, the removal of our ventilators or other life-sustaining equipment that we brought on our own simply because we're disabled. And again, determining because of our disability that we don't have a quality of life, may react poorly to treatment or are unworthy of being treated. And that is facially discriminatory. Next slide. Thank you so much, Andres. I really appreciate that summary. And hopefully, I'll be able to share some ways that the Reef Foundation is incorporating some of that feedback and in, into action, into change, in ways that hopefully you can help us do that. So the next section of the, the webinar, we'll be talking about some advocacy principles, and then we'll get into some more specifics. This may be obvious to many of you, but it's always a good reminder to understand you know, how smart advocacy creates momentum for change. And it does feel a little awkward uh, these days since we're operating mostly behind a computer screen, but we can still organize and we can still connect with one another. We can, the Reef Foundation can share with you its goals. You can share your goals with us and with each other. And together we can come up with a plan of action so we can either appeal to a congressional member of Congress or to um, in state, um, a state governor or to an agency. So it's really important to stay connected to either the Reef Foundation or other disability organizations that you may be a part of and learn about issues and stay involved and make your voice heard. So of course, part of our, my job is to build relationships with congressional members of Congress as well as agency staff, uh, especially within HHF. And the way I build relationships is really sharing the work of the Reef Foundation and showing that we're trying to help um, improve the lives of people with paralysis and mobility impairments and to really raise awareness around certain issues that are of concern and, and areas where um, these policymakers can help, uh, help improve things. So we, over time, you build trust with information and back it up with statistics and consistently show up persistently um, and also ways of uh, being available to help and serve as experts can also really build trust and influence over time. So this doesn't happen overnight. These relationships take time and, and you build goodwill early and perhaps six months from now, a year from now, we're able to kind of cash in on that goodwill and the groundwork that we've laid to really make some positive change. And then of course, after you have built power and influence, we can and persistently create momentum. So it can feel really exciting when you've done your homework, you've built relationships, and then you, you appeal to, again, either to a state governor or any sort of policymaker and, and make your case. And, and oftentimes they will listen. So again, it, there's a lot of power in groups working with organizations like the Reef Foundation. So why, well, why would someone want to hear from you? And again, I know many of you are very active, but just as a reminder, you are from the real world. Many of you live outside of Washington, DC and hopefully from an individual's district or state and you cared enough to, of course, in the old days, hopefully we'll get to return to that, come into Washington and maybe meet with your member uh, or if you're at home with a state representative uh, in person. Now, of course, we can do that very easily over virtual platforms. So that has given many individuals an opportunity to, to participate more in advocacy. So that's wonderful. You're organized, you're experts, 
uh, your personal story, uh, living with either paralysis or mobility impairment, you're the experts and they really wanna hear from you. And really at the end of the day, especially if we work together, we work with the foundation, we work with the foundation or within a coalition, they really wanna make people happy and we should really be prepared to ask for something. So with the right partnerships and coalitions, I just wanna remind everybody the Reef Foundation does not operate alone, especially on many of these issues. This, this issue impacts people across disability and we must work together to improve, improve um, the, the, the issue. So I just wanna remind people with whom we work very closely with. We are a member of the Consortium for Citizens with Disabilities, CCD, you may be familiar with them. I know many people really tap into their local independent living center. So we work very closely with the National Council on Independent Living Center here in Washington. And we also really tap into the expertise of the American Association of People with Disabilities. So a lot of the issues we work on are really, they overlap and we can't do our work alone. So we stay connected to these organizations throughout the year. Um, they, policymakers really wanna know that if we're working together, that we have our message together. So they wanna know that more people are for it than against it. And our coalitions can broaden and deepen, deepen the expertise and we're not just providing our one, perhaps very unique perspective. And it's critical to know where your lines are when joining coalition arrangements. So these relationships with these organizations have worked out really well because we offer our own unique perspective and we hear, um, you know, how others are approaching certain issues and we try to come up with joint, joint statements and principles together. So it requires a lot of listening and coming, coming up with plans together, not just as an individual organization. even though we work with coalitions, the foundation does have certain priorities that we really focus on, especially at the federal level. And I hope that many of you have tapped into the resources that we have at the Paralysis Resource Center. And just as a reminder, if you're not familiar, the Reef Foundation has operated the Paralysis Resource Center, which is nationally based, our headquarters are in New Jersey, but we serve all 50 states and territories and even international. And we operate this through a cooperative competitive grant from the Administration for Community Living and the Department of Health and Human Services. The Paralysis Resource Center provides free information and programs, including a peer and family support program. We have military veterans program, quality of life grants program, among other programs. And we offer individual, individualized assistance to Americans living with paralysis. So if you have a particular question or need, you're more than welcome to contact us directly and an information specialist will be able to take your call or question or email and help you um, individually until we are able to hopefully give you the information that you need. Uh, I just touched upon the information specialist. We've been privileged to help over 100,000 families through one-on-one -on -one assistance in over 170 languages. We have a third party translation service. We also have several individuals on staff who are fluent Spanish speakers. Reef Connect is an online platform. We've brought together over 7,000 users where individuals can ask questions about their personal experience and try to find information about some things that they may be going through. We have a very large virtual community on social media channels. As I mentioned, the Military Veterans Program, Quality of Life, the Quality of Life Grants Program, we've awarded nearly 30 million to over 3,000 nonprofit programs in the United States and territories. I should edit that. And if you're interested in learning more about this program, please visit our website. We, are, uh, we, have, we hold technical webinars where interested organizations that are dedicated to improving the lives of people with paralysis can apply for grants. We have a paralysis resource guide. We've given out over 200,000 copies. We have hard copies that we can mail to you. We also, that's all, all of our materials are free and downloadable as well. And the reason, oops, Oh, before I get to more details about the Paralysis Resource Center, I want to remind everybody that we've been trying to keep the SCI and Paralysis community connected and informed during the pandemic. Um, I know Andres brought up some really startling concerns around treatment and possible discrimination against individuals with disabilities, but we, want, we are trying really hard to keep all of our public health information up to date 
We have blog posts by individuals living with paralysis um, during this time. We have a healthcare expert, Nurse Linda, who's worked with the foundation for, for many years and decades, and she holds interactive conversations. So people feel that they're connected to the most up-to-date information, but she also answers individual, quest answers individual questions about their current experience. And as, as I mentioned, of course, my job is to, with Chris, to monitor all the policies and advocacy updates or during, especially during the pandemic. So if you need any individualized help, feel free to reach, us, reach out to us and you can find that information on reeve.org. So our advocacy priorities. Um, the Paralysis Resource Center, as I mentioned, is a cooperative grant, but we have to ensure that there's federal funding um, that Congress appropriates each year. So we've been successful in actually increasing this funds. And I want to thank any of you who have taken action on this issue. We really appreciate your support because Congress really sees the value and the help that we have provide individuals around the country. So that's one of our, that's our top priority, federal advocacy priority. Our second priority is around ensuring that medical research continues to be funded and increases, especially at the National Institutes of Health and the Department of Defense. Um, and we're, I'm excited to really work more on this next year and develop better relationships with individuals at NIH and the DOD. And also to get individuals involved in some of their peer review programs. And some of you may have already participated in something like that, reviewing grants. It's a really great opportunity for advocates and individuals who are impacted by paralysis to participate. Um, the third issue, again, we work a lot on this on some of those coalitions that I talked about earlier. We advocate for policies to improve insurance, coverage of treatments, devices, and rehabilitation. And we really focus on Medicare and Medicaid because Medicare often sets the stage for commercial payers to set their own policies. And again, we can't do this alone, so we work very closely with coalitions on these issues. And then our first, fourth priority is around advocating for the preservation and protection and improvement of accessibility policies, including civil rights for those impacted by paralysis. And we've spent a lot of time on working on around legislation to improve air travel, and we will continue to do that. But this is where we're going to add making healthcare more accessible for people with paralysis and mobility impairments. I'm really excited to take this on and also to continue to educate our coalition partners and to let them know that we really flag this as a really important issue, especially as we still continue to deal with the pandemic and hopefully when we start distribution of the vaccine. So what is Reeve specifically doing around this issue? And I wanna tell you that some of this is in its early stages. And I wanna also thank again, Andres, for, for helping me really sort through some of the ways that we can be most effective at, at an organization level. And you may remember in, in one of his earlier presentations, he talked about regulations that were set by the Access Board, which is a nonpartisan organization that sets standards and they were charged by the Affordable Care Act to come up with standards for accessible medical diagnostic equipment. And this was a really important report that was finalized in 2017. And you may remember, Andres educated us and let us know that the Trump administration unfortunately rolled back these regulations and they were never uh, proposed. And, they were, and so therefore they couldn't be implemented. So the Reef Foundation really wants to focus whether we continue with the Trump administration or we have a new administration to ensure that the Department of Justice really flags these regulations, proposed regulations as one of their top priorities. And I think we'll be more effective if we work with, of course, you as advocates, but also other organizations to continue to put pressure and support, um, pressure on these agencies, especially the Department of Justice to propose these regulations. Um, we will continue to support the National Council on Disabilities efforts around this issue. And internally in the federal government, each, some agencies have really prioritized educating the public on how, they can, how we can work together and educate pri uh, providers and hospitals on modernizing our health care. And we want to get more involved in some of those working groups. So we're going to spend some time trying to connect with the individuals who are overseeing these groups 
to make sure that we can also weigh in. Um, the second issue that um, we have flagged as really important is, of course, Andres went through a long list of, of ways that you can self-advocate to improve your experience when you go to a doctor's appointment, but it shouldn't really all rely on you. Uh, the healthcare provider, uh, you spend a lot of time, of course, educating everybody about your experience, but the healthcare provider should really come in already educated on many of these issues. And we really want to support the national adoption of curriculum that, um, and curricula that would really help educate healthcare professionals in a, in a way that's standardized across the country. So there are some avenues that we're exploring. We're hoping that perhaps uh, Ohio State College of Medicine has really worked on uh, fantastic curricula that we hope we would, we would support being adopted. Of course, we could also potentially develop our own um, education materials that could be paralysis focused. So we're going to pursue that maybe as a possibility. And we're gonna to continue to try to put pressure on the, the Medical College Association to adopt national curricula for people with disabilities. And again, National Council on Disability continues to work on so many issues, including this one as well. So we really wanna support their efforts. And of course, these will change over time and we'll try to keep you updated when we, we perhaps take a different avenue or pursue a different um, policy issue or response. Um, as we continue to navigate COVID, and again, Andres reviewed some really key and somewhat sobering issues that the Reef Foundation really needs to make sure they're monitoring also. And we would like to perhaps pursue a governor outreach to ensure that each state's crisis standards of care are optimal and, and of course in a gut in, in, align, in alignment with what the HHS Office of Civil Rights is reminding all healthcare um, providers that you can't discriminate against persons with disabilities even, even in, in a crisis. We know that there are visitors policies that don't make a whole lot of sense and they're not necessarily Perhaps in the beginning, they made a lot of sense. Now, uh, to protect people, obviously, against COVID. But as you all know, family members, individuals with disabilities need someone, uh, usually a health advocate or a loved one or a personal care attendant, to be with them in a doctor's appointment or, God forbid, in a hospital or a more serious situation. And a lot of hospitals have really, really strict policies against this. And so we are going to hopefully reach out to the American Hospital Association. I'm trying to figure out ways that we can standardize it, standardize this. And my own personal experience working with some of our individuals who have contacted us on this issue, that none of the standards are, are the same. So hospitals have their own policy and we, we, we don't necessarily think that this is good for um, our community. However, we want to make sure that everyone is protected. So we're going to continue to work on that. As you know, unfortunately, Congress has not addressed a, an additional uh, package or pandemic relief. And so we'll continue to press forward on that, especially with our coalition partners. We're not letting up on this. And many of you have really taken action and been very vocal about the needs of the disability community, especially as many of these programs and relief programs have expired. Another issue during COVID is around the lack of data and the healthcare disparities that Andrea so eloquently talked about. There are several pieces of legislation, including the one that I've listed here, that the Reef Foundation will support and try to work with congressional members to continue to put pressure on HHS to ensure that they collect the right data. Because without the right data, we'll, we'll, we will not have good outcomes for people with disabilities. And we won't be able to learn lessons from this very difficult situation as well. I know many of you hopefully have been able to benefit from the relaxing of some of the standards, not quality, but standards around getting access to telehealth appointments. And while we think this is a huge win, we want to ensure that this does not in replace in-person appointments. And furthermore, we don't want this to give um, 
the idea to anyone that then they don't actually need to make their their offices accessible. So we want to make sure there's a balance because we know that many people are able to get maybe appointments they couldn't get before, but there's nothing that replaces an in-person appointment, especially for many of the things that Andreas went over. And then finally, I know there's a lot of talk in the community and on the news around how the vaccine will work once one is approved or maybe two will be approved. I'm not necessarily sure of all the logistics around when and if, but when we wanna ensure that there's a, a really safe and fair uh, distribution plan. And we wanna make sure we educate the community throughout that process as well. So what can you do? And my colleague Chris is gonna talk a little bit, a bit more about ways you can get involved with the Reed Foundation. I, as I mentioned, we'll make sure that these webinars are available to you for to review. We covered a lot of information. And of course, if you have any individual questions where you need information or resources, we can give them to you because we wanna make sure that you know your rights, ways that you can advocate for change and to make sure that you have all the educational resources at your hands. And then telling your story to policymakers and your personal experience around this issue is very important. And um, again, Chris is gonna talk about how you can participate in some of our campaigns. And before Chris goes, I just wanna make sure I think, uh, I'm not sure, okay, I think some of the questions have been answered, but we'll definitely have time at the end for additional questions. And Chris, um, why don't, I'll go to the next slide and just let me know when you would like me to advance the slide. So I wanna thank everybody listening. Thanks, Kim, and thank you, Andres. It's really great to be here. I've enjoyed the first two webinars, so I'm happy to be able to, to be here and offer a view on the Regional Champions Program, which is a really important program here at the Reed Foundation. It's, um, it's really at the, at the center of all of our advocacy efforts and our engagement with Capitol Hill. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about it. Regional Champions Program services are legislative first responders sending letters and phone calls um, in order to alert elected officials when important issues arise. And this is something that many of you here already know about um, because you've, you've been involved in the program and have taken um, lots of action just over the last few months since I've joined the Reeve Foundation on some important issues. Um, for example, at the end of July, we were, we were urging the House of Representatives to pass funding for fiscal year 2021 for HHS and to fund the Paralysis Resource Center. And we were able to send 1,291 emails to members of Congress urging them to, to take that up. And fortunately, the House of Representatives did. Um, Later on, and, and repeatedly, we've been we've been urging um, members of the Senate to, as Kim mentioned, to keep in mind the paralysis community when forging ahead on any COVID relief legislation. And unfortunately, that has not come to fruition. But in the meantime, we've sent 2,883 emails to members of Congress voicing our concerns. So. That's just an example of, of some of the work that we've done in the past. And as, as more and more issues come up, which there, there certainly will be as we're coming to the end of the 116th Congress and going into an election, um, you can rest assured that early next year, um, there's gonna be a lot of activity. And I was even on a call this morning where they were projecting, you know, the Senate might not take up an FY21 funding bill until sometime in February or March. So. Um, be on the lookout around that time for, for more calls to action. But most importantly is developing relationships to educate legislatures. That's really key to everything because, um, you know, we can sometimes forget when we're reading in the newspaper or we're watching on cable news that, that it really is just, it's regular people that make Capitol Hill operate. and and the members themselves rely on the staff for so much and and they really rely on their own constituents to educate them on on whatever the issue might be so when you join the regional champions program 
taking the time to, to reach out to members of the staff, and this is something that I would be able to help you with if you were to join the program, um, to set up those meetings, to get those relationships with key members of staff and to, and to, to stay in contact with them um, will really help them understand the pressing nature of these, of the issues that we're talking about and um, help it get to the forefront of the member themselves so that they are well-educated when it comes time to casting a vote. Uh, attending select in-district events, you know, this is something that for the moment has moved to the digital space like, like much of our lives have at the moment. Um, but we've had, we've had members of the regional champions who've had successful meetings through Zoom um, with congressional staffers. Um, we have heard that there's been some difficulty with, with getting face-to-face -face meetings. Again, I mentioned this, this call I was on earlier today. People were expressing some concerns that staffers prefer to, to maybe talk over the phone rather than be on the video conference. Um, and that's fine. That's part of the program is sort of adjusting to, to the needs of and the, and the desires of, the, of your audience and just making sure that you're flexible and, and meeting them where they are so that you can ensure that your interaction is as positive and productive as can be. Um, I'm going to skip ahead to work with the Reef Foundation to share your story via photos and videos. Um, is this also harks back to something that Kim mentioned, which is the importance of, of getting your individual stories out there um, and front and center for staff and for members of Congress. They really rely on that type of firsthand information. And um, you can check out the Reef Foundation blog where you can see the way that members of our community advocates and regional champions have sort of stepped up and, and used that space as a way to to get their own um, expertise out into the world and to, and to sort of forge the conversation. Um, more recently, we had a blog post from a, a counselor living in Michigan where she was uh, talking about some of the ways that the post-quarantine world can, can kind of look at how the world has become more accessible for people with disabilities or people with paralysis. Um, since we sort of shut everything down and gone to a digital space and, and considering what, what things we might want to keep when society starts to open back up again. And more recently, we were, through our Instagram page, able to highlight the work of one of our regional champions living in Savannah, Georgia, where she was talking about the way the program has, has given her confidence in, in communicating with elected officials and through getting in touch with her member of Congress, um, helped her, in fact, get, get into contact with members of her local government and start to work on, on local changes to sidewalks and some of, those, some of those smaller, more local level issues that have a huge impact on people's lives. So with all that in mind, um, recruiting others to join the advocacy efforts is key. Um, this is a grassroots movement, so we, we really rely on people talking to people and, and sharing their experiences working with the foundation. And um, you know, we want to make that a priority as we go into the end of 2020 here. So Kim, you can move on to the next slide now. And here's our goal. Um, we have the Regional Champions Program, like I said, is, is our legislative first responders. And at the moment, we have about 50 regional champions, um, and we would like to certainly increase that number. But before we can do that, we really want to increase the number of our advocates, which are mostly the folks who are, who are taking the time to, to send out those emails um, when we send out action alerts to our, to our team, um, to their members of Congress. At the moment, we have 7,535 advocates. Um, on our list, which is which is huge. That gives us such a strong voice when when issues come up that we want to take to Capitol Hill. Um, and we want to get to 10,000 by the end of the year. It's it's an achievable goal. Um, and 
you know, we're, we're able to, to push the word out through our social media channels and through some of our blog posts, but relying on, on our regional champions to, to talk with the people that they know who are equally as passionate about these issues as they might be and to sort of spread the word organically um, would be a great help. So take note of that number there. You can text advocate to 52886 um, and that will help you get signed up so you can stay up to date on everything that the foundation is doing and how um, you can get more involved. Move on, Kim, thank you. Um, and of course, all of this, all of these efforts really start at the polls. And um, I had mentioned the, the blog post, uh, you know, considering what changes in the quarantine world might lead to a more equitable society. And um, considering that, the foundation decided it was probably a good idea to get some information out to people about voting this year and some of the some of the information that might be helpful for you in making a decision on how you want to vote and how you can do it in the safest possible way. Now, it is estimated that there are roughly 35 million Americans with disabilities who are eligible to vote. Now that obviously includes the whole um, scope of disabilities as it's defined. Um, and that represents such a huge demographic that is oftentimes, you know, not, not really spoken to from candidates. Um, 14 million of those people cast a ballot in 2018. Um, and I believe it was maybe 16 million in 2016. But be that as it may, with some of the decisions that have been made by state and local governments to um, have an increased uh, infrastructure for mail-in ballots and to really encourage people to vote safely uh, using the post office or you see in some instances states that are allowing you to go online and print out a ballot and that you can mail in. Um, you know this is really a great opportunity to extend that right to, to more people um, and to get more people to the polls. As you, you know, the Americans with Disability Act and the Help America Vote Act ensure the right to vote for everybody. And we've seen many states develop all sorts of novel ways to get around the challenge of the virus and ensure uh, more people can get to the polls. So I would encourage you to, if that link is working, um, it may not be, but we can, we can maybe drop it in the chat there. Thank you. Uh, check out our, our guide. We just put this together and this was put up, I believe, earlier this week. It's, it covers all 50 states in the District of Columbia. Um, it gives you some information on application deadlines to get your mail-in ballot, your voter registration deadlines. Uh, the first one is coming up. I believe it's the state of Rhode Island on October 14th is the, is the earliest deadline to uh, register to vote. And it also gives you some links to the State Board of Elections website and a little fact about different services that the states are offering for voters with disabilities. So I would really encourage everyone, if you have any questions about, about voting this year, to check it out because I hope it'll be a helpful guide for you all. All right, and if you have any questions, um, you know, if you know some people that that may want to get involved um, as an advocate or as a regional champion and, and, and you'd like to give them some more information, you can please feel free to pass along my email address. I'd be happy to talk with, with anyone and everyone. And um, if you have any questions on voting or if there's something missing off of our guide that you need help um, navigating, please let me know. I'm here to help and, and you know, would love to, to hear from everyone. So thank you. Chris, thank you so much. Um, that was a wonderful overview. And we hope that for those who are not involved, you'll consider get, you, you will consider getting involved in our, in our program. And if nothing else, access, accessing some of our information online. Uh, before we get to Q&A, I just want to offer to Andres if there's anything he wanted to add 
or say before we get to questions and answers? Uh, Kim, thank you. No, I, and, and Chris, thank you for that presentation. Uh, you both have uh, imparted some critical information here. And I'm, I'm just privileged to be able to work alongside you and, and assist the Reef Foundation in this effort. Likewise, we're very, very, very grateful. So let me see if there's any questions. Um, I feel like we may have answered the one question, but again, Chris's information, Chris C. Carson at ChrisFareev.org if you're interested in reaching out to any one of us or if you want further information around our program. But we want to thank you for joining us again for the third webinar. We hope you watch all three if you haven't. And um, we'll, we, will stay, we will stay in touch on this issue and other issues, especially as we move to the end of this Congress and into a new Congress and perhaps a new administration. So I want everyone to stay safe and well. And please contact us if you need any help or assistance at all. So I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their afternoon and um, your weekend. Thank you so much.